although it has produced laughter, not surprisingly, the several times I have mentioned it and let Kairu throw out one-liners, a little past whatever seemed to have struck you initially, even if it was just humor, does anyone smell any real otherworldly, not in a spooky sense, but somewhere postgraduate of the ordinary post-speech development of a nervous system, some possible significance to me pointing out that if this kind of activity had a motto, its motto would be, we ain't got no motto. Mm -hmm. Or if this had an actual premise and we was going ahead and state it, it would be, this is the kind of activity, the premise of which is, it ain't got no premise. <laughs> You don't know how close that is to the very edge where the ordinary nervous system, at least on our planet, our part of the universe, to where the nervous system is absolutely to the point that it almost cannot make a further jump. <laughs> Which is why I'm suggesting you makes it, to some people, so interesting or so funny. But to say that this has no motto, conversely, you do comprehend, or I'm going to try and hint to you, that when you get past or to the post-silent development, that is the speech development of a nervous system, here on our planet, now I'm of course referring to human beings, the more that they are driven by, the more that they are fueled by the kind of energy that is intellectual energy as differentiated from the kind of primary energies that run sex, hunger, desire to keep the body at a kind of homeostasis within certain boundaries. But when it gets to that point, in a quite real sense, everyone has a motto. It is like the premise of their life that I've said that everyone seeks, even that seem to be fairly non-intellectual perhaps in their profession, perhaps in their social life. But people have a motto, even if you would think someone with a minimal education, driving around a pickup truck, a good old redneck conservative from any part of the world, that is, from any part of any nervous system. Notice they even have bumper stickers, and all of them are not obscene. Sometimes it says things like, I shoot tailgaters. Now, do you understand that in a sense, do you understand in a sense that is somebody's motto, not necessarily his 24-hour day motto, because if the Pope had a motto, or if, you're, if you had a motto, they don't have it 24 hours a day. I mean, if some minister said, my motto is Jesus saves, if we were talking about the Western world, well, not 24 hours a day. Sometimes his motto is, I wonder if anybody will signify by this issue of Playboy. <laughs> <laughs> but in a sense, the nervous system has a motto. And this kind of activity has no motto. Everything that seems to be of even widespread importance on this planet, this part of the life of, of the body of life, all the major religions, do you realize, if you think about it, the Old and the New Testament, I'm going to suggest to you one of the reasons that keeps them popular, this is not it, this is not the only one, it's not even one of them, it's just one of them, is that it's full of mottos. Of course, I could say that Shakespeare is. Uh, the Art of Melancholy. Uh, Gulliver's Travels. But at any rate, those things that people believe, they're, they're wired up generally to believe, have some otherworldly importance, such as the Bible. But if you knew it, uh, the Quran, or at least the maxims of Muhammad have been put together, the sayings of Buddha that were collected, they are replete with what amounts to mottos. Premises, but they're mottos. They become axiomatic and people will stick them on their rear bumper. People will embroider them and hang them on their wall. Or somebody will go into business or putting them out on little plastic desk plaques and people will buy them. 
And they might say that they don't really believe it 24 hours a day, or that they wouldn't die for that principle. But that is a part of the human nervous system in this part of the universe. But in a quiet, real, and meaningful way that is straining the ability of everyone's nervous system at the highest end to grasp is the fact that the motto of this kind of activity, not mine, but this kind of activity forever, historically, as much as it may change or as little as it may change from time and place, but it has a motto. Everything's got to have a motto. You can't talk about it. But the motto the closest would be is, this ain't got no motto or that everything has a premise. There must be an initial statement, an assumed set or base of facts, some template, some matrix from which you start, like the first letter you ever learn, the first word in the dictionary. There has to be that, a premise, for whatever is going to follow. But the premise of this kind of activity would be, there is no premise not just to strain words at some literal level, not just for you or me to try and appear to be enigmatic, that, well, that makes no sense, so it must be of some deep significance. The deep significance is it does make sense. It's just as the nervous system where it is now can't make any sense out of it. Well, don't say I didn't bring it up again because I just did. As long as I have threatening since the last time we were taping to start telling you some, not just about what would seem to be, even though I deny it, the premise of how human life may be arranged in a way that's normally unrecognized, which I can do, and to, even while denying it, go from that premise, which I deny as a premise, but to go from that apparent premise and then to hint <laughs> point, sketch, and all the descriptions I've used about how a few people might be able to function, at least think about functioning, in a slightly altered way. But to go beyond that and just go ahead and tell you the way things are situated, I'm going to call them other planets. I've already done it, and I'm going ahead, but none of you seemed to choke the last time we were taping, and out there, whoever's seeing this on tape at some other time and some other place, I assume that you will hold on for a second or so and not choke and believe I'm talking about ordinary flying saucers and such as that because if you immediately want to jump on that you're not going to be here long anyway so but when I'm talking about if I continue about how things are on other planets you do need to keep in mind that there is a quite real universe in you quite real it has its own solar systems, it has its own planets, the inner planets inside of your solar, inside of your universe are not unlike, I could call them the red planet, forget Mars, I'm referring to the lower end, the pre-speech end of the nervous system, the red planet, blue planet, the motions, the yellow planet, you can see the kind of the world, the motor world, the limbic worlds, the intellectual worlds, are inside of you. You have your own solar system. It is what comes out, the kind of relationship between those worlds is what comes out in the attempt of one person to analyze another person as having a kind of distinct personality, which everyone does seem to have. But just like in the way I'm going to be referring to the different planets and the way things are inside of your own universe having these different planets that I was pointing out if I don't stop all the time which I don't plan to and point out that it might have some specific reference to one area in your own universe inside of you your own nervous system but that the planets such as emotional, intellectual and motor body planets to make it crude right quick from planet to planet they have different stages of development they have different customs they have different needs they have different life forms and so you're going to have that which is absolutely foreign 
as far as verbally describable, foreign life on one planet inside that same solar system, inside that same universe of you, you're going to have that which is distinctly foreign from one planet to another. The life form itself, its needs, its abilities, the way in which it attempts to fulfill its needs, the kind of energies that seem to be the primary fuel of one planet. And yet in the same way that you have an overall nexus and you have a dependence of interconnectedness out here in what seems to be our own solar system between the planets. Everyone knows that one now. Just accept science's word for it. If right now the moon took a trip, we'd all be probably in bad trouble. It would have distinct effects on us. If Venus suddenly exploded, there is a balance of interconnectedness inside of our own solar system. It's just an accepted fact, and trust me, it's a fair representation from Earth science. But even though I'm telling you that there is a kind of exotic foreignness between the planets inside of your own universe, between that which appears and manifests itself as different stages, different areas inside the solar system of your own nervous system, even though there are foreign aspects to it, they are likewise as inner and mutually dependent on one another as our literal solar system is even if the different planets, the different aspects of your nervous system are operating at a different wavelength. There's some things that appear to be of importance on one planet that even appear to be visible, that appear to be reality, on another planet, the next one over perhaps. The wavelengths are such that what might be visible on a blue planet, or the blue planet in you, might be absolutely invisible on the red planet just invisible. The life on that planet cannot take in through their own, due to their own life form. They cannot take in that as being reality. They, in other words, through any senses, they cannot perceive on that planet what is being perceived, felt, thought, smelled, touched, thought about on the blue planet. But do you understand it's not a matter that one is right and one is wrong, but if you could as a space traveler, if you could go from one of those planets and jump over to the other one, and you told them that on this other planet you can see things that you can't see here, then it's no longer a question if they had any, if they had an intelligence rivaling yours, if you could do that, they wouldn't be captured by the question of, well, wait a minute, does that mean it's here and we can't see it, or does it mean that they're imagining they see it? You understand that either one of those questions would seem to cover all the possibilities here on planet Earth, but that doesn't cover it. It's not a matter of whether it exists or doesn't exist. It's a matter that they couldn't perceive it if it did exist on their planet. The question is useless. There is not a word strong enough in our universe for moot <laughs> or useless. The question itself is misleading. Not to ordinary people, it doesn't matter. But to someone trying to see beyond the limits of the horizons of planet Earth in that its parallel intelligence, the question is destructive because it seems to demand an answer. And it does not demand an answer. It's not that any answer you can think of is wrong. They're all unsatisfying, but that's not the point. It's to even entertain the question, that the question has validity. Are there things going on that I can't see? And if so, is it because of some personal limitation? Are there things other people say they can see, and they can see it for some reason, that there's a shortcoming on my part? Or what other people say that they can see, did they just dream it up? To even entertain the question, forget the answer, because you're never going to get a satisfying answer to those questions. But to entertain the question as though this question deserves to be entertained. It does not. <laughs> It is that I'll tell you again that there are within you, there are pla planets that have vis-a-vis -vis one another foreign life forms, foreign. And it's, remember, it's past moot, if there was such a word. It's destructive to even be involved with, well, 
How come there seems to be a certain kind of lack of communication or some aspects of some parts of my own nervous system seem to speak a foreign tongue or seem to be engaged in activities that they try to get translated to some other area of my own being, my own nervous system, and it's as though something terrible happened, that somebody took the wavelength on which this started, by my sight, by my thought, and someone twisted it to such a degree that it makes no sense anymore. And furthermore, there's another one, such as our motto of this would be, we ain't got no motto, or the premise of this would be, this ain't got no premise. <laughs> the and furthermore, whenever I seem to pause somewhere, me or whoever was doing such as this, the and furthermore would be, there ain't no furthermore. <laughs> Now, of course, the truth is, there's not even anything up to the point that I just stopped. But to say there's furthermore, we're the back backward more. And there wasn't even that. But apparently you get to a place, at least there's a comma. Like we're going to comma here and then maybe turn the corner or go somewhere else. Furthermore, there ain't no furthermore. Okay. But I was going to say in conclusion of this opening, Salvoy, that you should consider the ramifications, if possible, of what I was saying for the last few minutes. I was either trying to tell you or to hint or to point out verbally about there being a universe in you. And it's ill suited for somebody attempting to do this for too long to mistake the apparently obvious for the really obvious. Mm -hmm. And it is unprofitable for too often to mistake cold hard cash for metaphorical currency, because there is a difference. Paper money is some of the conspiratorial fans throughout history like to point out that paper money is always funny money. They may say it's real money, but it's not the same thing as gold dust or a silver ingot. You can't continue too often, not at any profit to yourself, to mistake just cold hard cash for some kind of metaphysical monopoly money. Enough said. <laughs> There is a planet, next paragraph. There is a certain planet wherein they say the following. They say that there are no problems to be solved, that there are only issues that can be dealt with as they arise. For instance, I can make an example. It's not absolutely untoward for me to use this example. On this particular planet, let us say that they're referring to labor problems, as we would call it here. Then if someone was attempting, if you had unions uh, threatening to go on strike to some big industry here, or if you had uh, unions attempting to organize an industry, the computer industry, something new or to... On this planet, they would not say, as the headlines might hear, they might say, labor problems playing havoc with computer industry. Let me just make that up. That is now as our part of the world right now is probably more dependent upon the computer industry than it is heavy industry such as steel production. Or probably they're neck and neck at least. But at any rate, if you saw the headlines, if you started finding out as many people that now are dependent upon, directly or indirectly, the world of computers, and they started having labor problems, that Jimmy Hoffa came back from the dead and the AFL or the Teamsters decided to go out to Silicon Valley and everywhere else now and to unionize all those little people with pencils in their pocket 
and it began to just bring our economy almost to a halt, then you would hear such things on the news or headlines as labor problems. And the president will be sending out or trying to appoint committees or sending out somebody from the National Labor Board. On this planet, though, that I'm telling you about, they would never say that. They wouldn't say that there's labor problems to be solved. Mm -hmm. They'd say that there are, in this case, some issues involving the labor that have arisen that we're going to try to deal with. But that said, they would never say that there are labor problems. They would never say that there are economic problems. They would not say that there are territorial problems. If Canada began to say, you guys, we've been noticing, you keep inching the border further and further north, <laughs> and we finally called on, we want you to stop it. <laughs> or we're going to arm all Canadians with snowballs, and you guys are going <laughs> to... <laughs> on this planet... That's what I meant by territorial. That here we would say there are territorial problems. And there would seem to be something that must be solved, such as two adjoining countries. States could go to war over this. That these are problems, or a problem that must be solved on this planet. They never say that there is a problem of any specific nature. That there is a problem to be solved. But in the midst of what we would call here a problem, such as labor, a territorial dispute, they would say, assuming they had papers, they would say, labor issue under consideration or being dealt with. Issues that arise to be dealt with, not problems to be solved. <laughs> now, on the planet Earth, this is one of the times I'm not going to say that there is absolutely no connection between that because here in regards to what I just told you about that planet here the reality of that is sort of sort of so and sort of not so but it's sort of so in a limited sense it's sort of so in as much as someone post-intelligence all right a real explorer a real revolutionist as I was calling them as the need would arise would have to deal with what seems to be what I was pointing out on another planet it would seem to be a continuing arising appearance of issues in some field as opposed to the attempt to solve the problem but even here, someone who had some kind of postgraduate level of intelligence would, when the need arose for that person, treat what seemed to be the issue as though they had solved the problem. <laughs> Almost as though they had put a period on it when they knew better. Did that get too convoluted? They would act and even apparently think, if there was some way you knew about it or they let on, as though the immediate satisfying of the issue was in fact a satisfactory conclusion of the problem when they knew better. That doesn't, I was going to ask my old rhetorical question, that doesn't sound familiar. <laughs> Did I have run this out on you under other guises? <sighs> you could almost look at it as a kind of faux operational period to a functional sentence here on this planet. When I said it was so and not so, if that even got too complicated, you understand on this planet, the nervous system up to its ordinary level of operations does believe that there are problems to be solved 
and in some sort of fairly vague way, though, do get solved. At least you just have to say they're solved and kind of move on. <laughs> that, which is not the point. It's before that is reached, people would not be striving for anything here did they not believe that problems could be solved. Everyone standing in the death queue, all of us, people be dropping like flies either dying from suicide or are we or just general frustration you just hold your breath and think ah screw all this and hold your breath and die so there the energy that flows through man up to the level that past free speech up to the level that people are ordinarily intelligent that without it being stated that there is the promise that problems can be solved. It even, of course, goes beyond that level, if you're following what I'm saying, it's not that complicated. Hence, the ideas of an afterlife, which from some views, especially the free speech view, well, death, that it can be solved that if you think the right thing or if you believe the right thing or contribute your money and some time to the right institution then the problem of death which is kind of the big problem can be solved and it's solved that all right you die but then you come back and so ordinary people and i say it is so and it is not so here ordinary intelligence without it being stated quite this distinctly operates is made to operate in such a way that problems can be solved a post speech intelligence that is if you're somewhere a little bit past the intelligence level of the planet earth in one sense, you know that what appears to be the problems here cannot be solved. Well, it's, again, it's worse than moot. It's a dangerous premise to even accept the pr problem, see? Because that's the premise in the sentence that, all right, problems can be solved. Or if you say some problems can be solved. The, pr the premise is that there are problems. Nobody even questions that. You can say, all right, some problems can be solved. Some problems we can't solve. Some problems I don't know who we can solve or not. That is the level of human intelligence on this planet, which is just right. But if that's what you're satisfied, you're never going to get anywhere. You're certainly not going to get out of here. The premise in that sentence, in that whole string, in that whole flow of energies that runs the human intellect on this planet, the unstated premise is that there are problems. But if you stop ordinary intelligence, if you stop your own and say, do you realize every time you think about, well, we got to solve this problem, you understand there's a tacit premise in that? And your little intellect says, no. What? You say, well, you're, the premise is that there is a problem to begin with. And your own intellect would look at you like, have you been taking dope again? Are you having some kind of neural flashbacks? To when your mother hit you in the head with a brick? But certainly there are problems. That's not the question. The question is, is this one of the problems that can be solved? The premise. On this planet, I can't say the premise is wrong, because it's not wrong. I can't say it's specious, spurious, fallacious. I can certainly say it. But that's not it. The premise. And I can't even say the premise is wrong. But it's wrong to have a premise. If it wasn't this, it'd be something else. So it's true, or it's so, and it's not so here on this planet. That ordinary intelligence accepts the premise that there are problems. And that problems are to be solved. Whether you, you succeed or not, they are to be solved. To attempt to solve them. But remember this other planet I told you about? And they've got words similar. I know that. But they do not... Their intelligence is made to where they do not think that way. You know, so hence, they never say it, as I start telling you. They do not say that we have problems, any problem. They never say we've got a problem to be solved. 
they may say there is an issue that has arisen that somebody should deal with. The issue. And so if they were having labor problems, as we call it, they don't look at it like, well, all right, there's a labor problem. We've got to you know, fix it once and for all. On this planet, they don't have any kind of idea of once and for all. Because you don't fix any labor problem once and for all. You don't fix any economic problem here once and for all. I told you now, don't overlook. Don't keep taking the apparent obvious for something else. If there was a strike of some kind that almost crippled our economy, would it not be the headlines if some committee, the president himself, went there and they stayed up, ooh, I don't know, 49 and a half hours nonstop, and they loosened their ties and drank strong coffee, and then they came out clutching a piece of paper and the president of the, our own United States the big guacamole himself, and the head of the labor union. They come out and they shake hands and they take pictures and the headlines say, labor problem solved. Now, ordinary intelligence is going to go, phew. But now everybody knows what I pointed out. Everybody's going to know that that's not the end of labor problems. There was some minor labor problems still going on. The eastern pilots are probably going to still be on strike whenever this happens. But even if they're not, something else is going to happen. But you understand the human intellect takes that as phew. That our problems can be solved. It just takes right thinking people and blah, 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 and lots of coffee. <laughs> On this one planet, they, don't, they can't even think that way. And so, of course, they never say that. Someone on this planet can understand all of what I just said and still, when the need arises for them, for their own purposes, to act as though it is sort of so here. For them to know that what I'm about to do is somewhere between, I guess, spurious, specious, fallacious, moot, throw them all in your blender, whatever comes out, it's somewhere in there, and you go ahead and do it. You understand the beauty of being able to live on one planet and know something about other planets? That is to know that what everybody else says they're doing, they're not doing. What everybody else says works, doesn't work, and it's quite obvious. But if you know that, and then you go ahead and do it, and you play like it works, <laughs> congestions sometimes speak for themselves in the 3D world. <laughs> I could mention a postgraduate or a post-speech weapon. More specific speak. And you can use it here on this planet. That instead of telling other people how something will affect them, such as telling somebody that you recommend to somebody, uh, do so-and-so, it'll make you feel better. Now consider this, think about this, it'll help you. More specific speak. It's not to tell people how something may affect them, but rather comment on what would apparently be your experience, yours, such as this made me feel better. I found this helpful. I found this very interesting. In other words, you do not recommend to other people, but you comment, and if you know what I mean, you insincerely comment on your own apparent experience related there too. May I point out for a second that all of this has to do with and has validity in the body of life itself, in the actual universe related to our planets and other places. This also has direct pertinence, if you know how to do it, inside of your own universe, what I just said. 
rather than talking strictly about how it could be of benefit doing this thing that has no premise, remember. And of course, I got to remind you, I, it's not really multidimensionally correct for me to say that this is a benefit. Because to say it's a benefit implies if you don't do it, you're going to pay for it, and you're not. That you'll be worse off if you don't do it, and you know you're not. Unless, of course, you like it here. <laughs> or should I say, unless, of course, what's the opposite of that? Wait a minute. <laughs> unless, of course, you're not absolutely satisfied here. Maybe that's what I should say. But it's not going to hurt you, is it? Unless gravity is beginning to get to some of you. And if it does, don't worry about just finding your hips and your underarms begin to be pulled by gravity. It's an invisible place. That's where you don't want to sag, but anyway. And I'm sure that we don't want to pursue that much further. It's what if internally, between your own planets, this kind of thing seems to be your own dialogue, which is a form of the movements of your own heavens, rather than listening to apparently you tell yourself <coughs> you know what you'll do you should give up so and so because it'll make you feel better everybody does that to one another that is the way this planet is arranged people do on the basis that I'm only trying to help after all I'm your mother I'm your father I'm your best friend I'm tech if you would do so and so you'd feel much better and it may have the weight of the majority of creatures on this planet, such as, hey, if you'd get more exercise, you'd feel better. And that 99% of the people, at least in your tribe, your part of the world, would stand up and say, here, here. Even those with medical and official credentials say, that's true. Don't recommend, even if you're dealing with the interplanetary talk, as foreign as it may be, as subject as it may be to mistranslation inside of yourself, don't recommend, don't tell somebody, even if it's you, and don't listen to it, don't tell somebody, so-and-so is good for you. If you're going to say anything, say this. I tried it, and I liked it. I tried it, and it was good for me. There is a difference. And those of you getting this on tape, it is not a psychological difference. It sounds like that, but you are really tied to this planet. It's not psychological. I'm not playing with words. There is a difference. The second alternative I gave, of rather than recommending to people, is to, at best, if you're going to do anything, merely comment on your apparent experience. Notice I said one time, insincerely comment, and both times I've said apparent experience. You could make it up. <laughs> it's all right it's all right but don't recommend to other people do not recommend yourself that so and so will be good for you there's a difference it is a difference in the physics of energy itself not words not psychology to recommending to say do so and so or try it trust me it's good for you don't if you got to do anything and it's saying anything, don't ever say that. At best, at most, you could say this. If it's true, or if you know how to make it up. Is uh, By the way, I tried doing so-and-so once, and I felt much better. That's it. we got to turn the tape over. Of not recommending. Of, at best commenting upon your experience, your apparent experience. Another aspect, or another way I could try and sketch this in a little bit, it can make speech more direct and actually make it stronger and make it more useful. Since if you do it this way, if you stop all forms of recommendation, and I'll point one more time. This has nothing to do 
with any form of psychology or spirituality or humility or that by psychological I mean any aspect that you might recommend to somebody something that wouldn't be good for them or that they might be psychologically structured in a way that what you recommended would not turn out to be apropos to them. And that's way beyond all that. That's, that's just this planet's background noise. That has no real validity. I am simply telling you that operationally there is a difference and it can make speech, your speech, more useful and stronger because what it does is become more directly reflective of definition by usage. That is, it is more reflective of what actually happened. Now what actually happened, we're talking about in this case, if some of you didn't make it up, which then it did happen, but is you, that if you are in some way forced to talk to somebody else, and of course if we're talking about internally, you're always forced. You're either talking to it or it's talking to you. If you think there's a difference. <laughs> is you are direct, more directly now reflecting verbally experience. What actually happened. Not saying to somebody, if you do this, whoever the somebody may be, if you do this, you'll feel better. If you, if you try to think this way, you'll behave better. If you try and think this way, your emotions will feel better. It doesn't matter what it is. It's a recommendation. And you might say that even it's paralleling the closeness of blood kin between mother and son, father and daughter, that you would tell yourself nothing less attractive, well meant, that I would not recommend to myself anything I told myself we, we should quit smoking because everybody, even I know, even as much as I sometimes enjoy us, I know that this can't be good for me. And so, really, why don't you quit smoking? No recommendations. None. Don't say it'll be good for you. You do recall, I use the term again, that I tried to weasel, sneak in out-of-town information some weeks back to point out that a revolutionist, an explorer, begins to understand that there are two definitions of every word on this planet. One of them is whatever the definition is, and the other one is something else. Remember? And the something else is the definition by usage. And I imagine, again, I'm not stretching this. I'm not playing with the fact that words through their connotation or through their usage finally are a change in the dictionary that becomes reflective of the change in public usage. I don't mean that. I mean at any given time a word has its own definition. I don't care what it is. But everybody says every word has a definition. That is they have taken a frequency, a burst of energy, and they called it a word. And they say it has a definition. All right, it does. I accept that. I have to. I couldn't go in and say, may I have a loaf of bread? I accept their definition. But every word has another definition. It has its, its known definition, and it has another one. The other one is usage. And not this public usage that eventually can gradually affect a change in the dictionary definition. No, 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 no. That's still the definition. This other one is always running at a kind of parallel reality. But the more you can find some way to use what I was describing as more specific speak, is do not make any recommendations to anybody. And if you do not, if you simply base whatever you say on your experience, at least that's what you say, that I tried this once. I quit smoking for a while and I felt much better. I'm just saying I felt much, much better. You have changed the frequency of the speech. It is stronger. Whether you think we're talking about now interplanetary communications that is between you and somebody else or whether we're talking about something else. 
it comes very close again to putting a period, an operational period on something, even if it should be that you know better. It has another aspect that is worthy of at least some note. By engaging in more specific speak, that is, by ceasing to recommend anything. But you can do the same thing by simply, apparently, recounting your experience related thereto. It does something else. It tends to limit continued discussion. <laughs> what that is let us say it's two people talking and you say listen as your close friend I'd like to tell you if you had quit smoking you'd feel much better that is not going to put a period anywhere but if you say I used to smoke and I quit smoking and I feel much better how can another planet, I'm sorry, another nervous system, how can it discuss what you say you feel? Well, if you tell somebody, if you would, if you'd be more religious, if you would, if you'd be so, if you'd be less aggressive, you'd feel better. Now let's say that that is common knowledge, or that's the common wisdom, clinical, psychological, psychiatric, and everyday wisdom at our time and place that if you would be less aggressive you'd feel better and so you tell somebody that they will still discuss it even if apparently from one view that the weight of evidence is on your side but it keeps it open to discussion always if you say if you do so and so you'll feel better if you make a recommendation they can do such things as well that may be true but uh you know, who died and left you a doctorate degree? Or, or how do you know this? Do you have any statistics? Have you ever done it? How long did you do it? You can discuss it forever, and you're almost helpless, even if we're talking about inside of your own solar system. But if you do not recommend things, if you simply apparently recount your experience, and if you say, uh, I used to be, I'm probably more hostile and aggressive than you are, and, uh, I cut down on it, and I feel much better. What can you say to that? Can you argue and say, oh, no, you don't. You're just saying that. <laughs> Not in the middle class of planet Earth. It would take people playing out at the fringes. Because ordinary bourgeoisie intelligence, it just limits, to say the very least, further discussion if you say, well, I did so-and-so, and, -so and uh, I feel better about it. I feel better. What can you say to that? <laughs> as all of you old-timers out here know, I'm not bringing up such matters as this and even couching them in these kinds of verbal clothes to try and help you get along with your fellow man better. <laughs> And so again, you're almost faced with the possibility of a kind of faux, sham, except operational period. When you know it's not true in a sense. When you know that you have absolutely, operationally, gone beyond the limits. You have strained the fabric to the point that sometimes you can hear, <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, by knowing that this is not what it seems to be, but if you know that and you still do it, you remember that? Need I say more? <laughs> there is another planet that's close to the one I was just mentioning that I would like to point out because I almost mentioned it in another context a few minutes ago. But there is a planet in that same solar system that will not tolerate the opposite of what I was just describing. They just, it's the way that they are wired up. That is, that they cannot tolerate. That is, it doesn't exist. That's what I mean by tolerate. I, some of this I have to try and put in some verbal context to where it makes enough sense for me to even bring it up. But they do not tolerate. They, they can't tolerate if it occurred, is the point, of listening to someone else comment 
on how they think something would affect somebody else. Did I get that too convoluted to you again? There are other planets, or one in particular I'm talking about, that they are not wired up. The creatures there, the universe of that planet inside their own systems is not such that what I was describing can't even occur. They couldn't tolerate it. That one of those creatures do not tell them, though, when uh, I think that you'd be better doing so-and-so, or that you would feel better if you do so-and-so, if you'd behave in an altered manner, their systems can't tolerate it. I just thought you might find that interesting. I'll give you an axiom for the night since we don't deal in axioms. Is you are, you're helpless when you're hungry. At a quite primitive level, at a quite basic level, if we're talking about down to the red planet levels of your solar system internally, you surely understand that if you're hungry, you're helpless. You're at the mercy of whoever can feed you. If you're a prisoner somewhere, if you're staying around out in the jungle's lost and you suddenly stumbled upon a little village somewhere, and you are, I'm talking about hungry, you understand hungry, you are helpless. That is, they say, hey, are you hungry? And you go, <laughs> they say, well, you probably guess or you probably suspect we got some food. You say, well, let's see. Would you like to have some of our food? You know, what will you do? <laughs> right. Stone your head and make funny noises. You're helpless. This is also pertinent to the higher nervous system areas inside of your own system. That is, you should not be lingering around your own worlds, your own dialogues internally that have the hungries for certain things. Mechanical affection, ordinary sympathy, routine fears, wanting to be frightened, <laughs> recognition. That is all of those, and I could keep naming them, it's not that they're bad, even though the Old Testament and the Koran and everybody denounces many of what I just said. That's just planet Earth wisdom. They're not bad, but you are helpless if you're hungry because they cannot be fed. But you are helpless if you linger around that kind of area. If you want to look at it as being a kind of a little village or your own potential captors. Because even if you wander out of the woods hungry, and these people do not physically put you in chains or lock you up in a hut. You do understand you're captured. They say, so you're hungry. Right, stone your head and make funny noises. Then they have a laugh at that and they say, hop around one foot until you drop. You are captured. If you linger around where you've got the ordinary hungers of this planet, the ordinary hungers that drive through the dialogue in you, of the such things, not that they are per se wrong, evil, they're not even questionable, they're just hungers to want to be recognized, to want to have sympathy bestowed upon you, to want somebody to empathize with your own self-destructive feelings. Uh, you want someone to admire you, to like you, you want somebody to dislike you. Those hungers make you helpless. And it's not to try and encourage somebody to be sans feeling here because you can't do it. Even if somebody was crazy enough, me or somebody, to say what you should do is have no feelings, no desire for anything. <laughs> don't, don't worry, you're safe. I mean, if you ever run across some kind of double mint guru like that, <laughs> at least you can't get hurt because it's not possible. All you're dealing with is somebody that really had his or her feelings hurt real bad. <laughs> and of course, now... Now their premise, now their message of enlightenment is down with feelings. You know, right. But, I repeat, if you're hungry, you're helpless. And it's not that in some way wanting recognition, wanting to have somebody sympathize with you, it's not that that's going to do you any harm. Unless you consider the potential harm is that you'll never get off this planet. 
the first way to describe it is the hunger cannot be satisfactorily fed. That is, it's a problem that can't be solved. And so no matter what you do to seek sympathy, to gain recognition, this kind of thing is almost known. Life almost lets it out, except it's the kind of thing, it's real fast history and everybody forgets it. That somebody will be interviewed or finally write his autobiography. I worked my way up from the gutter and now I'm one of the richest men in America. I'm one of the most famous entertainers in the world. Somewhere toward the end of the book, if not the middle or the front, the person says, you know what? Sometimes I think I was happier when I was living there in the ghetto, when I was living in the gutter, when I was on the farm and didn't have anything. And me and my first wife were starving and riding around in a 49 Hudson with no gas. <laughs> sometimes, I, sometimes I think that those were happier days than it is now on my yachts, and et cetera. And everybody hears things like that. And of course, if you're not rich and famous, you won't go, yeah, fuck you. you know. <laughs> I'm glad to hear you're miserable. But people have been admitting that for years and years and years and years, but then you forget it. If you're ordinary, because you keep wanting to get a better place in line here where you're waiting to be. <laughs> but you understand, if you're trying to get past the ordinary post-speech development of the nervous system, you can't hang around areas where you're hungry. That is, remember, I just didn't throw it in the initial axiom, hang around places where you're hungry that cannot be fed. There is no satisfying food. There is no solution to the problem of being hungry for fame, for wealth. The closest you can come, which by now you're too far gone, the closest you would come would be the satisfying of primary needs. That's why with certain people at certain times, food is such a delight. Sex is such a delight at times. That, you know, the old thing of Shakespeare or Burton or whoever it was that said it, that it was one of the few times ordinary people ever seemed sane is right after a good, a good run even, a good day's work, that good tired of just getting through and just fall down and pass out. <laughs> Except once you become more complex, that is all, you know, having secondary interest, I can point out, is not inevitable, remember? Not inescapable until it happens and it's too late because then it is inescapable. <laughs> but all of the hungers I was talking about, that was the reality behind the words such as fame and desire for sympathy and pity and all that, you do understand that by the way I've been describing it, that that is secondary areas. So there is no satisfying food to those hungers. You, if, you, if you really felt that the only thing you want out of life is to be famous in your field, whether it's cabinet making, ditch digging, painting, <coughs> that that's all you want. And if I ask you, well, describe what fame would mean, and you describe the kind of critics in New York and London, or how you would have to be feted when you showed up, the kinds of people that have to turn out and buy your books or your paintings or want your cabinet work, and you said that would do it. You do suspect, not to give you the blues, because if you can get the blues, you're on the right planet. You ain't going anywhere. <laughs> that if you got that kind of recognition, it still wouldn't work. I mean, that's just a fact. It's not a curse of the gods. That's the way to keep things, among other reasons, to keep things moving, to keep things alive on this planet, to keep it open-ended. So there are no satisfactory foodstuffs for those hungers. That's what I'm telling you is don't hang around where you're hungry that way because it can't be fed. The closest place that you could hang around was if, in fact, you can deal simply with food or deal simply with sex. Now, you can hang around there because other than the fact, remember, it's too late because as long as you can think, you'll get through with what would just seem like the world's greatest fuck, male or female, and just lay down. But then what happens? Then you begin to wonder, do we have anything to eat in the house? <laughs> or, or then you wonder, boy, if she's this good, I wonder how good her sister is. <laughs> or, you know, who knows what? <laughs> the point is, I can say, just as I was trying to describe the last few times, I can say that it's not inescapable to go from a primary interest to a secondary one. That it's not inevitable. I didn't want to say that the other night. I wanted you to think another way. I can say it's not inevitable except for this. Once it happens, then it's inevitable. It's inescapable. You can't go backwards. You can get off this planet and kind of go backwards. But here you can't go backwards. So the thing is, I'm telling you, is don't hang around where you've got the kinds of hungries that cannot be fed. They simply cannot. It just takes an idiot 
Why would you hang around if you're dying of thirst? Why would you hang around a salt mine? <laughs> there is, there is something else. There's something else, and I uh, may I remind you of what I said in the beginning about mistaking too long, too often real currency for metaphorical play money. And so what I was going to say was there's one more aspect of hanging around where you've got those kind of secondary hungries, and that is it lowers your immune system. It weakens it. Now you can make it out what you will for the time being, but I am telling you, it does. It weakens your immune system. One more. You remember the planet that I mentioned last time we were taping, wherein the people clearly recognize the difference between primary and secondary areas. Primary and secondary interests, talents, needs, hungers, energies. Now I told you that they clearly recognize them, now on to something else. In relationship to that. Mm -hmm. But unlike that planet, here there is no such recognition, and it results, I'll dichotomize it, which works out just right, since you can't produce a coin with three heads in this, on this planet, so I'll do it the expected way. It manifests itself in ways that are not normally recognized, that serve particular purposes that certainly then, of course, it follows are not recognized. Prime examples go like this. That you have creatures on the planet Earth that are driven to cross over what I can describe as the natural boundaries between primary and secondary areas such as the difference between eating to stay alive. It doesn't mean you have to eat tree bark or something you hate, but simply eating as opposed to dining. Shelter as opposed to a good address. On this planet, everyone is driven to cross over these boundaries. And of course, I'll repeat one more time, once the boundaries are crossed, there are no boundaries. The whole thing is not moot. Remember, it's somewhere else. It goes so far beyond moot and specious and spurious and irrelevant that it makes me even gesture. That's <laughs> but the boundaries, the examples I was going to give, it pushes creatures here to do this, and it's not recognized, and certainly the purpose, possible uses is not recognized, but I'm going to try and hold it up to the light of good Papa Saul here in our solar system. <coughs> Let's take a creature here on this planet that is less dominant insofar as the kind of observable binaural two-partner dance place in all activities on this planet, and there's always somebody leading at any particular moment and somebody following, the dominant and the submissive. Let us take a creature who generally is not wired up to be dominant. That is, at the primary level, they would not be in a high position in a kind of pack hunting, pecking order. Some of you might call him a nerd, if you're ordinary. This kind of, let me say nerd, but now do you understand what I mean? Because as much more nerd is not an attack on any of you who, or any of anybody that might look like one. It is somebody wired up at the primary level to be less dominant, that if indeed 
we were still pre-speech in our development, and that we were in some way similar to hunting packs, wolves, non-speaking creatures of some kind on this planet, they would be down at the bottom. But you've got to have a bottom. You've got to have a pack. The king is not more important than the kingdom. A king without a kingdom is a laughing stock. He's out of work. He's in the gutter. But you have somebody that the primary level would have been less dominant. Somebody in our day and age, I guess a fair example would be, and this less dominant, if we were still at the primary level, now I'm pulling it up to the secondary, the civilized, more mechanically complex area of life on this planet. This person, let us say, starts a computer company, develops it, comes up with the idea. Then it reaches a stage that once the idea turns into not just thinking of action, but turns into action, and the computer company gets operating, then it turns out that this person, the creature who started it, who thought of it and brought it from the invisible into the visible, then lacks what apparently would be the aggressive nature to be a real CEO of the company and keep it going. <laughs> he is ill-suited. He has gone from, one more time for you people on tape, the premise of what I'm saying is not a premise. It's not that something is wrong. I'm having to describe things that is your own intellect that takes it as being an attack or that I'm pointing out some flaw. The person who was not wired up to be dominant shouldn't start a company. Wrong. I'm describing things that are indescribable. I'm describing things that you cannot really see while standing on this planet. It's like trying to see the bottoms of your feet while you stand there. <laughs> but so just listen, just try and remember that. If we were still pre-speech development, if everything could be arbitrarily, artificially, described as being at primary or secondary stages, then I'm saying that this guy that started this company, or this woman, that thought of this grand design of a whole new computer put together, somebody got the money and it got cranked up, it then turns out that he or she was not suited, was not dominant enough at the primary level to hold the thing together, to even hold on to control. They could not manage people. They could not run a herd themselves. There is a withal easy example. You could take, this happens all the time too, by all accounts, the meanest, the strongest, the fastest player in the NFL and you find continually, he gets interviewed a few times, he hangs around a few years, and he, it's just almost a given, who began to make sounds of wanting approval and recognition as being an intellectual, a scholar. So he threatens, as soon as my career is over, I am going back and finish my master's degree, thank you. Wrestlers, anybody of this ilk will continue to, they'll almost invariably fall back on, it's a grand tragic mistake that the public makes thinking all football players, all linemen especially, are just dumb are just dumb jocks because there's much more to me than that. All right, in one sense, there's not. And sometimes you or somebody else on this planet can sense that. The interviewer may even roll his eyes. <laughs> But in another sense, it is true because what the person is doing, you understand, it's the same thing as this nerd I was talking about who was ill-suited, who did not have the genetic aggression to run a company, that is to do the action that he could think of the action and apparently get it going, to in some degree bring the invisible into the visible, to bring something that life had start out as a primary level and turn into a secondary activity, to start a new company, a new institution, a new church, but then to keep it going, he is ill-suited. The guy that's already wired up to be this mean, aggressive lineman, hockey player, anything, is also 
absolutely stretching or attempting to stretch the genetic limits of what was his primary talents and abilities. And it's not, I'll try one more time, I know some of you are getting fairly good at this, it's not that something is wrong with either of those guys or that non-aggressive guy stirring the company. There's nothing wrong with that. I even hate to have to say that anymore. There's nothing unusual, there's nothing out of the ordinary, and there's nothing out of the ordinary, there's nothing funny, there's nothing to laugh at, of this football player, this hockey player, this rugby player saying, you know, I'm not as dumb as I act. It's true and it's not true. But do you see that this makes for what appears to be strange failures of communication in this universe, on our planet, that people believe, just to use these examples, that there are such a guy who started a computer company, and maybe he loves football, and they, during the half, they say, we're going to have some interviews that we taped earlier with such and such, and he thinks, boy, that's one of my favorite players, and the guy comes on, he starts trying to quote Shakespeare, say, when I get through, I'm going to teach school, and the guy sitting there with, that started this computer company is about to go down the drain, or somebody's about to, the stockholders, the original capital financiers are about to take it away from him because he's letting the whole thing come apart. But he'll sit there and watch the interview on TV of this guy, and he thinks to himself almost, ah, you know, Big Bad Bob or what his name was, you know, you don't do that. You're making an ass of yourself. That is, he understands from his own level, from his own planet, that... You know, you're a great football player, and I love you. I even got your jersey number. I wear it sometimes on the weekend. But <laughs> of you saying that you are, there's much more to you, that you're smarter than you look, the nerd understands you're not smarter than you look. You're faking it now. <laughs> but if he was as verbal, the football player could go out and watch a speech, maybe, that this nerd, the founder of the brand-new computer company, when it's real hot, he's invited around to make speeches at seminars. And so he may get up and talk a good talk about how he had to fight his way and the ideas he had for the brand new computer company and the designs that people laughed at him and how hard it was to get money. But you've got to stay in there. It's kind of like a football game. You can't give up just because you get behind, you get thrown for a loss, get back up. You've got to keep fighting. The football player, if he was that verbal and he was there, and you jumped into his universe and you said, what do you think of that guy? The football player just knows by looking at him. The magnetic, the electromagnetic spectrum available on this planet, I say look at him in the full sense of the word, just as the nerd looked at the guy on TV, the football player, and he knows he is not more intelligent than he looks, even though the guy says he is. The football player, based upon his own sensual, which is all he's got, knowledge in the electromagnetic spectrum that if you ask him, if you could talk to his internal universe and said, what do you think about that guy and him talking about a, the way you start a company is like a war, like a football game. If he knew how to verbalize it, he'd realize, well, the guy's a pussy. <laughs> yeah. The guy's a wimp. You know, I, I don't know, I don't want to think about business, but uh, him talking about, hey, you got to get in there and marshal with troops and all that, the football player wouldn't know what to say except he knows that's a whole bunch of baloney. That it's just not true. This guy is down at the pack. He's at the bottom so bad that you'd have to pump air down to him. <laughs> the point, or one of the possible points for me bringing all this up is, some of these other plants I've been talking about, and I may continue to do so, I can point out things, and I'll start off saying, all right, on certain planets, uh, they clearly recognize the difference between primary and secondary activities, and they never confuse the two, for instance, which is not all of it, but I could say that. And so from one view, you might hear some of this, which I expected you to, and to continue to, and it may sound as though it's more advanced. That is, that, well, hey, if things were like that here, I hear what you're saying, we'd be better off. Tut, tut. And one more possibility, like I said, of mistaking the obvious, the apparent obvious, for the really obvious, and metaphors for reality and vice versa there's another one now I think about it is you mistake advancement for being static because all the things I've described now on other planets I just say that that's the way it is or that 
that planet where they cannot tolerate, they're not wired up to tolerate someone telling them a recommendation of saying, well, do so-and-so, it's good for you. You'll benefit. That they simply can't do it. Now that might, I could make it, sound as though that would be a boon to this planet. Just because it may sound more advanced, you got to listen. It may simply be a way I'm describing a kind of static situation, a closed-in situation. Why would we have a nerd trying to start a business when he's not wired up to hold on to it? Why would we have football players, hockey players, standing up on public TV, making absolute fools of themselves, saying, yeah, I really hate it when they talk about how dumb we are. <laughs> I ain't no dummy. Why would they do that? The needs on this planet are such that things are still cooking. The joint's still jumping, as that great philosopher Louis Jordan once said. Things are not static. The things are static, if they indeed you find anything, if you could remember it, if it was still of any note, it's of no longer any importance whatsoever. As long as you have got people from one view, an incorrect view, but from one view of having people ill-suited, the nerd trying to run a company, the football player trying to pass himself off, trying to tell himself, trying to tell somebody else that he has the potential to be a scholar. This is not foolishness. It's not incorrect behavior. It's not some form of delusion. It is a churning up. It is a cooking. It is a continual aliveness that is necessary on this planet wherein there are other planets that I know of, or I wouldn't tell you about them, that at times where I can describe that things are a certain way there, and I'm not saying that they are more primitive, but there is a difference between being static and being more complex. There's a difference if your nervous system from one planet, from one view, says, well, now we'd be better off if we were like that, what you just described. Do you see that that, one more time, is beyond fallacious, erroneous, moot. You, you can't start with a premise. There's your first mistake. To just assume, if I say, well, I know a planet where such and such is true. And you just meet the premise says, well, boy, you brought that up, but I'm sure you're going to try to metaphorically encourage us to think, well, what if it was like that here? What if I could use that internally? You're taking the premise says that you'd be better off. If there is such a safe premise that there's some way you'd be better off and you can spot it, how the hell don't you do it? Of course, I'll answer that. I don't want to leave you with an open-ended question here on a Wednesday night because you can't. Because you're not supposed to. But you're supposed to think you can. And you're supposed to be upset if you can't. And you're supposed to imagine I'm going to keep pressing on until I solve the problem. <laughs> How much time we got? Five minutes. Five minutes. Well, I'll quit, and you can have this five minutes left on the tape to silently ponder the errors of your ways. <laughs> and I hope you seriously take that to heart.